So good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really happy to be with you tonight. And I'd like to thank my good friend Walid for inviting me um, to this meeting or to this lecture uh, tonight. I'd like to thank you as well for streaming in to watch my uh, lecture on a Saturday night and instead of watching a movie. Uh, feel free by all means to come along with your popcorn and drinks uh, to watch my lecture. I promise I'll try my best to make it as light and interesting uh, as it could be uh, on a Saturday night. Uh, before starting from the very outset, I'd like to make it clear for everyone. If you're here tonight uh, waiting to listen to me lecturing you about how to anesthetize an emergency laparotomy, you're definitely in the wrong place. I would advise you to log off and uh, find something more interesting on a Saturday night. Um, I'm rather here today to talk to you about, like what Walid said, uh, a very high risk uh, procedure uh, that carries high mortality and morbidity and try to work out together what can we change or what can we improve in the quality of care uh, of that quality of patients. Um, uh, I think I shared uh, uh, your lecture now, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, so am I now in control, Ali? Can I control it? No, I will control it for you so you can tell me the next and I will bring the next. All right. Uh, so next, Ali, please. So sorry for any uh, so, sorry for any delay. Uh, I think we you jumped one uh, slide, but that's that's fine. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, first of all, conflicts of interest today. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. Um, then um, let's let's delve on our topic uh, tonight. So first of all, my objectives from my talk today, uh, like I said, to highlight to you guys uh, why emergency laparotomy uh, is something really uh, important uh, and why you should uh, talk about it and the approach that we're gonna uh, have tonight uh, while talking about it. Uh, then we're gonna talk about how can we improve the quality of care that we offer to that cohort of patients uh, in our workplaces. And as a clinician working in UK, I'll be trying to draw lessons uh, from how we do things in UK as regards uh, emergency laparotomy. Um, what he put on uh, a poll for you, some survey, quick survey, just to spice up uh, the meeting before starting. Uh, just to have a flavor of the audience, uh, what are the way of thinking about emergency laparotomy and how they approach that important uh, procedure in their practice. So first of all, uh, the first question is very simple really. Uh, what's the seniority of the audience listening to us today? Uh, either consultant or middle grade like resident registrar or senior registrar. That's a very simple question. Uh, next question will be, um, do you use a validated objective risk assessment tool uh, while um, doing your emergency laparotomies, pre-assessment uh, uh, of your laparotomies? Again, same question, yes or no, please. Um, do you use cardiac output monitor uh, for fluid replacement uh, during the care of emergency laparotomy? Again, that's a yes, yes no question. Um, after you finish your laparotomy in the middle of the night, uh, where do you send your patients? Are you comfortable enough to send them to the ward uh, and go to the encore room or go back home? Uh, or do you communicate with your ICU and HDU colleagues and try to work out a bed for your patient uh, post-operatively uh, on the ICU? And as someone with interest in pain medicine, uh, I'll feel guilty really if I do this lecture without talking about analgesia for emergency laparotomy. Uh, so what's your usual analgesic plan for those patients uh, in addition to using simple analgesia? Do you opt for thoracic epidural? Uh, do you opt for rectal sheath catheters uh, and uh, patient-controlled analgesia of opiates? Uh, do you use patient-controlled analgesia of opiates uh, alone? Or do you have any other interesting means of uh, offering analgesia to that group of patients that will be very interesting uh, to share with us tonight, please? So if you answer those questions, this will give us uh, a very good idea about how you guys approach emergency laparotomy. And then towards the end of the lecture, we'll be able uh, to reflect on your answers and see what we're doing is the right thing uh, or not. Next, Walid, please. Uh, so I'm leaving uh, the poll here for a couple of minutes. And during that time, I will jump to the next slide. But I would say, I would say if you give them a minute or two, because the survey will be just on top of the slides. Yeah, of course, no worries. Yeah, I, I'll just, it's, we had 13%, I will give them two minutes or get 50% of the answers and then you're okay to go ahead. 
I, I just can't see that from my side. You cannot see, uh, but it's happening. I, I can see it on the screen as well. Okay, but do you see uh, how many and percentage voted for the questions or just the questions? No, no it's showing on the screen. Uh, so now about 70, 80 out of 200. Perfect. Perfect, okay. Questions. Good. Uh, the majority are middle grade. Uh, the okay, majority so we'll is stratification uh, before looking after emergency laparotomy patients. Um, not all people use cardiac output monitor. Most people will send the patients to HDU and ICU, which is really good. And um, that's interesting. Actually, a lot of people will use rectal sheath catheters and PCA opiate, uh, but more will use PCA opiate, and even more are, are, are using other means of analgesia. And I'll be really interested to know what sort of uh, analgesic plans uh, they have for those patients. Um, so if they can write in the chat box, uh, we, we can go to this later and, and, and see what sort of analgesia they are using. I think that's enough for the poll now, Ali. Thank you very much Perfect. for that. Okay. So if you can minimize it or close it, please. Well, you can hear me. I, I can hear you. I already minimized it. I, I, I closed it. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's start now, guys. So why do we think uh, emergency laparotomy is important? Unfortunately, in the Middle East, we're not very good. And, and I think most of the audience today are coming from the Middle East. We're not very good at collecting numbers. Uh, while here in UK, we are good at doing that. And numbers tell us that annually, we do about 30,000 to 50,000 emergency laparotomies. Uh, we know for a fact that it's a costly surgery. The surgery itself, bringing patient to theater uh, in order to do the operation costs a lot of money. And that even becomes more because more than a quarter of those patients uh, will stay in the hospital for more than 20 days. Uh, and this incurs a bill on, on the health system of about 200 million pounds uh, every year just for ward care. We're not talking here about returning to functioning and contributing to the community and succeeding in rehabilitating those patients and getting them back to their functional status. Um, and it's estimated that the overall cost of looking after emergency laparotomies uh, is more than 650 million pounds. Uh, which is actually a massive number. This is like the budget for some countries in terms of their uh, health care, uh, which is really scary uh, and might give you an idea why emergency laparotomy is something really important. Uh, what's more important is what we mentioned. It's a high risk procedure. The 30 days mortality of that group of patients is more than 15%. So in every 100 patients uh, undergoing an emergency laparotomy, 15 of them will die. This even becomes even worse uh, in elderly, frail patients more than 80 years of age, when this can go up to 25%. And in Western communities like UK and Ireland, uh, that's obvious because the healthcare system is good, longevity is there, and people are living longer. So we are coming across uh, a lot of aging, frail patients in our practice. Uh, what's more important and what's really interesting is the fact that this procedure or this intervention has loads of potentials for improving the quality of care uh, that we are offering to our patients. And that's what we're gonna explore uh, over our uh, lecture today. Um, so next question, uh, which is why we're, we're delivering this lecture today, how to improve the care uh, of emergency laparotomy. Next, Wally, please. And before delving in this any further, uh, I'd like really to refer you to a very interesting concept which is the concept of marginal gain. And those of you who are interested in sports, especially cycling, uh, might be aware about Team Sky, which is the British cycling team. Um, this concept of marginal gain helped this team actually to revolutionize their performance and achieve huge successes. That's thanks to uh, the name mentioned in the slide, Sir David Brailsford, who used to be the performance manager uh, of this team. He's not the coach, if you've noticed what I'm saying, He's the performance manager. He oversees the whole team and looks at the tiny, tiny things in all areas of performance. Um, and adding the, those all up together leads to maximization uh, of performance. Some people 
uh, call it the 1% gain as shown in, on, the, on the picture on the right hand side of the slide. Uh, it's the 1% that you can achieve in all areas of practice that when you add up, you will lead to maximization of quality and maximization uh, of performance. And actually the concept of marginal gain uh, is gaining access hugely uh, to the quality of care uh, in, in healthcare professionals. Next one, please. As you would expect, if we are talking about improving the quality of care of that group of patients, we'll break this into before operation, during the operation, and after operation. So if you get called um, to an emergency laparotomy, what shall you do before uh, bringing this patient to theater? Intuitively, you're going to go and assist the patient, but you have to be proactive uh, in this approach. You have to preempt, go and assess your patient. A lot of them might be frail and elderly. Uh, a lot of them might have been vomiting for a few days and not eating and drinking and dehydrated. Some of them even might have bowel perforation and they might be uh, suffering from a uh, sepsis condition. Uh, you need to optimize those patients before bringing them to theater. You don't want first time to know that you're dealing with a total mess when your patient is on table uh, and the surgeon is ready to cut open the patient from the sternum down there. And optimization can take different pictures. Um, this might be in the form of uh, giving them fluids uh, before your operation. Most of them will have some sort of alkalosis, fluid contraction alkalosis because of the dehydration. They might have all sorts of electrolyte disturbance, so it's very wise to top up these before going to theater. If they are septic, you have to give them antibiotics as early as possible uh, within the first uh, hour of encountering uh, them. Sometimes you might even need to admit them to a monitored place uh, like ICU or HDU in order to be able to do this. And most of times you'll find yourself in need to cite invasive lines like central line and arterial line for them while you're working on optimizing them before surgery. Decision making is of utmost importance in that context. And it's not only your responsibility, it's an MDT responsibility. It's yours, it's the surgeons, it's the intensivist, and it's also the patient if the patient is still retaining capacity or the family uh, if the patient is very unwell, intubated, ventilated. And you should actually help uh, the whole team to make a shared decision about what's going to happen with this patient. And this takes us actually to the next point, which is the objective risk stratification. Because if you don't have an objective tool in your hand uh, to communicate with the team and communicate with the patient or the family, you won't be able to reach decisions for those patients. And this is where using an objective tool, like right, what we're going to mention in the coming couple of slides, using an objective tool that gives you a number about mortality and morbidity is very important when you're looking after those patients. Here in UK, we cannot communicate about an emergency laparotomy or hand it over without mentioning what's the percentage of mortality and morbidity for this patient. And this even further takes us to the next point, which is the option of doing nothing. Sometimes you might go to assess a laparotomy in the ICU, for instance, and you find lactate hitting the roof more than 11 or more than 10. You find your patient very uh, uh, hemodynamically unstable, being on quad strength of silly doses of noradrenaline, vasopressin, uh, difficult to ventilate and oxygenate, uh, and the patient is in total mess. And it's totally acceptable to say, okay, we're going to stop here. We're not going to go any further. Uh, let's call it a day, keep this patient comfortable. Uh, and don't bring the patient to theater. But in order to reach this point, this needs actually risk stratification and communication with the rest of your team and with the patient and or the family as well. We talked about optimization. Next to Ali, please. And now we come to the objective risk stratification. Um, what's interesting, actually, there are loads of memes online. They are all for free. They are all easy to use. Uh, you have, for example, what's showing here in the slide. Uh, the American College of Surgeons, NSQIP, which is not specific to laparotomy. But as you can see, if you can see that uh, here, you can choose the procedure and you enter some parameters. And this gives you for different types of surgery, including emergency laparotomy, will give you an idea about the mortality risk uh, of this patient. Next, Walid, please. Uh, this NSQIP takes few minutes to fill in. You will get even better with it. And um, if, if you get used to using it for your operations and for emergency laparotomy. Here in UK, uh, we have a very uh, interesting application, which is totally for free. You can download it uh, from the App Store uh, called Neela Application. 
Uh, it's after the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit, which has been running in UK since, to, since 2012. And inside that application, there are two validated risk stratification uh, calculators. The very famous PPOSM, which can give you an idea uh, about mortality and morbidity of that group of patients, and the NILA score. Like I said, in UK, when we are dealing with emergency laparotomy patients, we can never communicate without saying what's the PPOSM or the NILA score uh, of that patient. And entering data actually on the NILA system, like what we're going to say later when we are talking about the UK experience, just to have information feeding from all hospitals about how we deal with those patients and what do we need to do in order to improve their care. Next, Walid, please. Then we move to the intraoperative period. Um, quite intuitively, uh, avoid delay. Sometimes most of those patients are category 2A. Uh, some of them might be category 1. And uh, very few of them will be category 2B or 3. So they are urgent cases. They need to come to theater ASAP. And as an anesthetist responsible about the emergency theater, you have to be careful with your prioritization of cases. Don't waste time on nonsense abscesses that can wait or a hernia that's very soft and can go on an elective list. If you've been told that there is a laparotomy and the surgeons are lingering and not making a decision, get hold of them and try to push to bring this patient uh, when everyone else is around, senior people are around. If you're a junior person and you have enough pair of hands instead of doing it out of hours or in the middle of the night when the patient is an extremist, you're tired and there aren't enough people uh, around you. The delivery of care ideally should be a consultant. Think about it. Uh, if this is your mom or dad or granddad or grandmom, you need a consultant anesthetist and consultant surgeon to have input, especially if your risk stratification tells you that the mortality uh, is more than 5%. You have to plan your analgesia. It's of utmost importance here because you cut open this patient from the Zephy sternum down there, and we're going to talk about analgesia uh, in a second. Uh, because this is very crucial to help with weaning from mechanical ventilation if they are intubated and ventilated and to engage with physiotherapy and rehabilitation uh, post-operative and getting them to their functional status. When you bring this patient to theater, think while you're doing induction about rapid sequence induction. Rapid sequence induction is a very English way of anesthetizing emergency patients. I'm aware that in other countries and in other places, people are not so bothered about that. Uh, but the last time I thought twice about doing rapid sequence induction for emergency laparotomy, I decided eventually I'm going to do it. And as soon as I inflated the cuff of the tube, we aspirated more than two liters uh, of vomiting from this patient that definitely by all means I wouldn't be uh, in a good position if they found their way uh, to his lungs while he's critically ill, and then on top of that develops aspiration pneumonia. So think about rapid sequence induction for patients who have intestinal obstruction, who are totally unwell, they have lazy bowel, and they can start vomiting as soon as you put them off to sleep. Lines, we talked about this. Sometimes you might even need to do the lines during the period of optimization. Cardiac output monitoring. A um, few years ago, that was very, very fashionable. All hospitals here in England invested in buying some sort of cardiac output monitor uh, of some description. In the market, there are loads of them. And the reason behind using them is actually to do goal-directed therapy of fluid replacement intraoperative. Those are patients who will have huge fluid shift. They will be volume contracted. Uh, they will be hypotensive. And you need actually to tail what you're doing using certain objective. Um, this can be through the analysis of the arterial line waveform using LITCO, for instance. Uh, the old LITCO needs calibration, so it's laborious uh, in theater, uh, or LITCO rabid that doesn't need calibration. PICCO, bit laborious as well, or as simple as flow track, or even transosophageal Doppler. And you can target parameters like stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation and the change in stroke volume in response to fluid boluses. So it's quite good tool uh, to tell what you're doing for your patients. You have to choose your fluids as well. Uh, evidence suggests that crystalloids are okay. Sometimes when you're dealing with a fluid contracted alkalotic, alkalotic patient, using saline for fluid replacement is the way forward. Me personally, uh, I add to this using 5% albumin, which is readily available here in UK, but there is no strong evidence or robust studies that support this. Uh, it's the fact that it's cheap, and it's a colloid, 
And we are all aware that other synthetic colloids are no longer in the game, like heat starch or uh, gelofusine, gelatine. Uh, so using albumin uh, might be uh, good in terms of fixing the numbers of the patient, but I have to be honest with you, there is no strong evidence uh, on, on, on that. Next one, please. Uh, and like I said, analgesia. Analgesia is of utmost importance. You have to have a plan uh, in place. Uh, it has to be multimodal. Uh, bear in mind that most of your patients and Prof. Suleiman was talking about nutrition, most of them will be nail by mouth for variable periods, uh, post-operative or might be on parenteral nutrition. Um, when you're giving opiates, just bear in mind that those patients will be at risk of constipation. In first place, they might be complaining of alias uh, post-operative as well. Thoracic epidural is a very good option, but a lot of those patients will be septic. If you have a patient with very raised white blood cells, CRP, and behaving septic, you have to think twice of sticking a plasticky catheter uh, in the spine of this patient and putting him at risk uh, with the bacteremia of developing uh, epidural abscess, which might be disastrous. So a lot of clinicians would avoid using thoracic epidural in those patients. Rectal sheath catheters, they have revolutionized the care of those patients. They are easy to insert. Uh, you have to encourage your surgeons in your hospital to learn how to do them. Um, it's a, a, a plane, so you have to put a big volume of local anesthetic uh, through them when you're loading them at the end of surgery, and then connect them to infusion uh, along with PCA uh, opiate, which in combination work as a treat for those uh, patients. And I mentioned uh, uh, at, at the bottom, perioperative use of lignocaine infusion. Um, there's a lot of research about using lignocaine infusion intraoperatively and postoperatively in colorectal surgery. But actually, after the enthusiasm with using lignocaine infusion, uh, this, th there is a most recent Cochrane study that actually proved that there is no big difference between using lignocaine infusion and using a placebo. And after pay, people were very, very fussy about um, using things like um, uh, 48 hours at least of lignocaine infusion and searching for ICU bed in order to be able uh, to run this. The, the evidence tells us that more than 24 hours it's not beneficial. Just bear in mind when you're doing it that this patient is acidotic, uh, hypoalbuminemic. Both of them can increase his risk of toxicity. And if you're doing something like rectal sheath catheter and you're going to load your catheters at the end of surgery, so then we come to the most important period. period. What, what can we do in order to, 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 to avoid development? Um, and, and this is why I was asking you, you become become normally the regime that your patient is for one milligram per hour. One milligram per hour is a loading than one milligram per milligram per hour. I see an immense afterwards. How do you deal with those patients? Those patients need a lot of clinical input and you can't just leave them on the board, especially if you're doing them late at night. You have to focus on rehabilitation, and that needs a proactive physiotherapy team in your hospital to help those patients with early mobilization, breathing exercises, etc. Nutrition, and we have brought to the man with us today. You have to think about the nutritional plan for those patients, either parenteral or parenteral, and this will happen in discussion with your surgeon and with the dietitian in your hospital as well. Uh, as, as we, we said, a lot of those patients, patients will be elderly, elderly will be frail, and the, the best team to ask to have input, input in their care are the geriatric medicine people who are able to address the needs uh, of elderly, frail, frail patients. Um, so, so as, as you can, can see from uh, the first part of our lecture, it's, it's all about the marginal improvements that we can, can do around the care of emergency laparotomy that they can adopt eventually in order to improve the quality of care uh, of that high-risk, uh, costly uh, group of patients are our practice. Uh, now, let's move to how we do things here in the UK and what sort of lessons can we get out of the way we do things here. Uh, so, so like I said, in the UK, UK because they realized that, that this is a procedure that carries high risk mortality and morbidity, and they carried out a national audit project called NEA. It's very famous. It started in 2012. It actually produced so far five uh, reports um, about how the whole country uh, is doing with emergency laparotomy. And as we, as we will see next or in the coming couple of slides, the fifth report shows us how we improved in certain areas and how we need further improvement in others. So it's not just um, head and run, it's not just an exercise, then done in the ICU and run away. 
collecting data and collecting, collecting information will help us know where we are standing at the moment and what, what do we need to do in order to improve the quality of care. This, this can be even a little bit of cost to them. And the, the, the next point in this slide tells you that that, that works in, 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 in places that are proactive. So the Emergency Opportunity Collaborative Program that started in 2015 was also started by a Royal Surrey Hospital. It's a single hospital down south in England. And actually, they developed a care model for the care of those patients. No, no rocket science in it. All it's all about the points that we discussed in the prayer of the care of those patients. But they put them in a bundle. They followed this bundle and they collected uh, information. And they realized that there is market reduction in mortality and morbidity of their patients. And other hospitals found that it's a very good idea. So it was adopted by other hospitals as a national initiative for uh, the care of their group of patients. Uh, here, here in UK, UK and this has to do with the means of, of or the way of funding of the healthcare system. And um, hospitals get the best tariff for what they do when they stick to the highest uh, quality of care of emergency department patients. So, so you, you get, get your funds based, based on your results. results. And that's, that's really a very interesting concept. So they get the best tariff uh, if their numbers and their, uh, that they provide about the emergency department. Uh, are up to speed and are good numbers. And like, like I said, data collection, data collection tells you everything. Tells you where you are standing and where you need to uh, go further. And share the experience between hospitals. Any big university hospital, Egypt for example, and as long as I'm addressing a lot of Egyptians at the moment, any university hospital can take the initiative of setting up a project and then expanding this project across the country in order to work on improving the care uh, of that group of patients. Here in the UK, we are moving towards what's called an integrated uh, healthcare system, where they the all the hospitals together into big bodies. Uh, so we are moving towards centralization of services, and instead of diluting the care or the practices of emergency laparotomy on different small hospitals, and then diluting the learning curve and the resources and the outcomes, we are centralizing the care of emergency laparotomy in bigger hospitals in order to make the learning curve steep for all the team members and make, make the best use of resources and achieve the best outcome uh, of that group of patients. Next, Next slide, please. please. Uh, that's, that's the website, the website for NILA. I advise all of you guys to go and visit this website. Uh, this, this project has been commissioned to the Royal College of Anesthetists uh, in 2012, in addition to other uh, healthcare organizations uh, in England as well. And like, like I said, since then, then all hospitals, uh, next slide, please, please, all hospitals will have input. Uh, like you can see, they, they gain access, access um, to, um, to, to, to the NILA project, project, and then they, they can, can enter information, information by anesthetists and by surgeons in order to know how this hospital is doing with that very important group of patients and whether anything needs to be improved. And they, they produce regular reports, uh, which are quite helpful in directing uh, where we need to go with our nurses and our Next slide, please. please. That's, That's the, the most recent, recent report. Uh, it's, it's the infographic um, uh, illustration uh, of, of the report. You can, can find the detailed report on the website. So as, as you can see, the mortality rate that they mentioned earlier, earlier which can go up to 15% or 25 in elderly patients, has been sitting at around 9.6 since the last report, which is a good achievement. The length of hospital stay as well has dropped. More and more clinicians are doing risk certification because this helps them uh, with communication with patients and communication with teams. And even with being able to make the decision of no option, no intervention. Um, uh, as we can see here, um, uh, the, the input from senior clinicians uh, has increased. Um, we are not doing very good in terms of um, getting, getting patients to critical care, care but only 77.5% uh, of patients. Well, actually, we are now in the COVID era, era and this is growing even harder and harder. Uh, but we should actually endeavor. endeavor. If you cannot, you cannot get an ICU or HDU bed, bed, leave your patient in the recovery area, area uh, overnight, monitor. monitor. This, this will, will give you commitment and work. work. Yes, yes that's, that's right. right. The, the recovery nurse might, might not be happy, happy because you're giving her extra work, work. But, but that's for the sake of, of, of your, your patient. And um, patients uh, were, were able, able to get CT scan uh, across the country, country. and in a good number of them, that, 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 that was reported by consultant and radiologists. 
uh, which, which is uh, very, very important, important as well because in a lot of instances you find conflicts in opinion between the surgeons and the junior uh, radiology uh, resident or registrar uh, who reported the CT scan and sometimes they need to discuss this further. And um, the senior input uh, is worse out of hours as expected. And don't, don't be shy to call your consultant. I'm a senior registrar. I'm becoming a consultant in a few months' time in Manchester University Hospital. And I don't feel shy at all or undermined. That, that happened to me last weekend. I had run of six of the promises. I picked up the phone and I rang my consultant. I told him that this is the plan I have, but he needs to be in hospital in order to make sure that we're offering the best care to the patient. Not necessarily in theatre. I'm in charge of managing everything. He might be in the back room, but he's physically in the hospital. You, you need the fresh pair of hands, the competent fresh pair of hands. You need the fresh mind that will do lateral thinking with you and help you with decision making when you're tired and knackered uh, after your um, night shift. And not, not all patients were able to, in the number eight, eight here, not all patients were able uh, to get to theatre in a timely fashion. fashion. Those with sepsis were more fortunate uh, than others in terms of getting to hospital in a timely fashion. fashion. Number 10 tells, tells us that we are not unfortunately very good at giving our patients antibiotics uh, early. And number 11 tells us that there are loads of frail patients uh, in, in our core of emergency laparotomy, uh, being an aging population here in England. Uh, but not all of them, them unfortunately, had input from geriatrician. And now, uh, number 12 tells us a very interesting thing. It's about patients with learning difficulty and autism. Uh, that we're more fortunate uh, having senior input in their care and having access to critical care uh, post operatively. So, as, as you can, can see from, from this uh, summary of the report of Miller, we improved on things, and that's by reflecting on the numbers that, that we are collecting. But we still need to work more and push forward more in order to improve in other areas uh, in the care of that group of patients. Next, Next slide, please. Um, so, so just to wrap up our uh, lecture today, the recommendations we'll be able to come up with from this lecture, data collection. Someone has to take the initiative. We have big universities. Uh, we, we have, have good, good initiatives, initiatives but, but we are bad, bad at numbers. numbers. Uh, someone has to take this initiative, start it locally, and then spread it across the country in order to improve the care of the group of patients. Like I said, local registry would suffice, and then discussing the results in your local mortality and morbidity uh, meeting. But ideally, if you can expand this on national uh, level, you will be doing favor to the whole uh, country with that group of patients. You have to have clear pathway, written pathway, uh, for the care, care bundle for all those group of patients in your hospital. And it's not uh, very difficult. You're not going to invent bicycle. Go online and you'll find loads of resources that can help you to pull together a care bundle for that group of patients. And by all means, it's not only you as an initiative, it's a collaborative work between you, ICU, and uh, your surgical leaders as well. Next slide, please. So in summary, to what we mentioned, that's, that's a very important, important group of patients that we have to be careful while looking after. And there are huge uh, areas where we can improve the quality of care. Similar thing to apply to other areas. The leader thing most recently gave a talk about necrophemia fracture. That's another area where there is a huge amount of improvement that can happen in their care. Um, they have high mortality and mobility, so we have to be careful. Uh, they, they have, have potential, potential for improvement, and we have to work on that. And like, like I said, it's a collaborative work at all levels between different team uh, members to get the best care to that group of patients. Next, Next slide, please. Thank, Thank you very much, guys, for your listening tonight. And sorry, sorry for the technical problem that I faced earlier. earlier. Uh, and, and I'm happy, happy to receive any questions, please. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, Walid, I can't hear you. I don't know why. Okay, sorry for that. So uh, the first question here by Ahmed Muhammad Hassan. One of the most impact or factors on outcome of emergency laparotomy is inflammatory response. Is regional intervention as thoracic epidural have better outcomes? So he's talking about the evidence on thoracic epidural um, to modify the inflammatory response. I'm not sure if there is evidence, Ahmed, about that. Uh, I'll, I'll go and search. I'm not sure. I'll doubt if they can link uh, both together. Bear in mind that if you have a septic secular parotomy, um, th this patient will be vasodilated. If you're going to use thoracic epidural, you're going to dilate them further. If you're going to struggle with blood pressure because they are septic, you're going to struggle even further with the thoracic epidural, plus the fact that you can give them, if they have bacteremia, you can give them an epidural abscess. So you have to think very, very carefully uh, before saying, I'm going to offer this patient thoracic epidural. It's the best mood of analgesia. I'm, I'm not contesting that at all, but you have to risk assess your patients one by one uh, before jumping to that conclusion. Uh, so, uh, in concomitant with the second question, I'm starting the uh, assessment poll for your attendance documentation. So, please go ahead. And the second question, Dr. Mahmoud, uh, is Would you recommend the use of intrathecal morphine as an analgesic tool for these kind of patients? Uh, yes, I do, if it's a, a sub umbilical or lower abdominal laparotomy. Uh, we use here in UK diamorphine rather than morphine. For obvious reasons, diamorphine is lipophilic. Uh, you're not you're not going to have the uh, the problems with the hydrophilic morphine of delayed rostular spread. Uh, so we use diamorphine instead, and we use it in colorectal surgery or um, lower incision laparotomies. But if it's a midline laparotomy, I doubt that this is going to uh, offer good analgesia for for your patient, uh, unfortunately. So it's it's more with lower uh, abdominal uh, like subumbilical incisions. Uh, rather than the midline ones. Um, uh, I have a personal experience with minimal invasive esophagectomies where they go uh, for uh, first stage is laparotomy or mini laparotomy or laparoscopy and then go for thoracotomy. So it's it's a long surgery and we have been using one milligram of uh, uh, water-soluble morphine intrathecal, but the only condition the patient has to have post-operatively is a high dependency unit bed. And my own experience with this in like 10 to 15 patients I did myself is it works perfect. So a uh, patient does not require any post-operative and GCF for like 24 hours after surgery. But I am again not sure if it is like a huge laparotomy, will it work or not? I don't have that input. So it was a minimal invasive phosphagectomy in particular. So uh, thanks Khaled for your uh, question. It was a very interesting one. Uh, Ali Saab. Uh, what about pain control uh, follow-up in the ward? Uh, is it the anesthetist or the surgeon's rule? So uh, I will talk about my hospital after you, your experience, Mahmoud. Well, to be honest, Khaled, I'm a pain physician, right? It will be some sort of insult if you're telling me that my surgical colleagues will look after the pain of my patients. In our hospitals, and I think this should be the case in all hospitals, we have an acute pain team composed of nurse practitioners, and those nurses can go and do follow-up uh, for the acute pain patients postoperatively. And if they have any concerns or worries, they will come to me asking for input and asking for help. So definitely not your surgical colleagues. It's either you if you don't have acute pain team or um, your acute pain team if you have one uh, in, in, in place by all means. Uh, definitely, I'm sharing you the same experience here, Mahmoud. So it's the pain team responsible for that. It's not the anesthetist did the surgery because next day he will be doing another surgery in theaters. So he will not have enough time for that. Definitely is not the surgeon. Again, he will be in theaters making a quick round in the morning. There's a pain team responsible for that all the time. So there's a special plebe. They can contact anytime the patient has pain. So the next question by Ahmed Sharabi. When is starting rectus sheath infusion? Uh, we do it, Ahmed, at the end of surgery. So the surgeons uh, stick them in under vision. Uh, and then we um, activate them with 40 mils of 0.25% polyvacane or levopolyvacane. And there will be an infusion ready afterwards, either through an elastomeric uh, bump uh, or the epidural uh, bump. And we'll run it around 10 mils per hour uh, of 0.1 or 0.125 of levopolyvacane or polyvacane, along with PCA opiate, uh, either um, 
oxycodone uh, or fentanyl because most of them have kidney problems or morphine if they don't have kidney problems. Uh, so a question by Amr Mwafi, is erythrospiny plain block uh, as feared as thoracic epidural in this group of patients? Uh, erythrospiny is gaining a lot of uh, turf in modern practice. Uh, I'm, I've been involved in a service of using it uh, for refracture patients and I think I do have uh, a lecture coming up for the management of uh, chest wall uh, injuries. You do. Uh, we'll talk about that. But Ahmed, in order to use it to cover a laparotomy, you have to do it bilaterally. And I, I, I'd like to, to, to tell you from my own experience, in the best hospitals where the pain team is ace, top pain team, and top nurses looking after those patients postoperatively, they will be confused having two infusions or Y connection and one infusion running through the erectrospiny. The margin of error will be really high. So I think if you're going to do bilateral erectrospiny, go for thoracic epidural instead or rectal sheath, as we said, if there is contraindication to thoracic epidural. A question by Ali Saeed, which is another interesting question. Uh, when do you resume uh, your anticoagulation post-operatively, especially if the patient has a thoracic epidural? Uh, so with a spinal or epidural, you can resume your anticoagulation four hours to six hours from the time you put the line in. And then if you're gonna remove the catheter, uh, you have to time your anticoagulation. So you have to stop your anticoagulation if it's prophylactic for 12 hours, as if you're gonna do a new one, or if it's a therapeutic anticoagulation for 24 hours. Uh, but having a thoracic epidural should not delay uh, giving a patient a prophylactic anticoagulation as long as the surgeons are happy with hemostasis. So if they are happy that the patient is dry, you don't have any worries about hemostasis, you can, the, the same night of surgery, you can give the patient a prophylactic anticoagulation. And by all means, th those patients will have mechanical prophylaxis in the form of TED stockings and plot drones as well. Uh, but you can give it Six hour, four to six hours uh, after giving spinal or after giving epidural. Uh, as a pain consultant, uh, Mahmoud, I think this question is a bit tricky for me, but not for you. Uh, Muhammad Ali Ahmed is asking, what do you prefer? What's your preference? Thoracic epidural or rectus sheath block with a catheter? Uh, like I explained, depending on the condition of the patient. I, I won't have enough courage to go uh, near a septic patient with a thoracic epidural. Uh, if most of times you come across those patients and they have uh, CRP in three figures, 300, 400 plus, and white blood cells more than 30,000. I won't feel comfortable, to be honest, to stick thoracic epidural in those patients and put the, them at risk of spinal uh, epidural abscess. Plus, uh, they will be hypotensive. They might be already on vasopressors. I won't have room to activate this thoracic epidural. And if I do, <coughs> I'm gonna move the blood pressure even further and struggle with the blood pressure. Uh, so in, in that cohort of patients, I would prefer erector sheath. While if it's a patient that's stable enough, not looking septic, then a thoracic epidural is a very sensible and reasonable uh, approach to those patients. Okay, uh, a question by Adil Milad. Uh, I'm not sure if he asks about intraoperative or postoperatively, but he's asking about ketamine infusion and magnesium sulfate as a part of the multimodal analgesia. Uh, of course, Adil, um, giving uh, ketamine and giving magnesium uh, will have opiate sparing effect. Um, chronic pain, chronic post-surgical pain in emergency laparotomy is not that common. It's common with other operations. So I don't think you will need to run ketamine infusion unless uh, the patient is in terrible pain for whatever reason, for example, chronic pain patient on loads of opiates and then he had laparotomy, he can't take the amount of opiates he was taking beforehand. Uh, it's not uh, a bad idea to start ketamine infusion in the ICU or HDU. You can do this on the ward. Uh, but a lot of people will give one of those of ketamine intraoperative, like 0.25 milligram per kilogram, and they will give some magnesium, which will help with the hypokalemia in an alkalotic patient to reabsorb the, the potassium and will help with analgesia as well as an opiate sparing uh, strategy uh, rather than for prevention of chronic pain because like I said they, they, they are not at very high risk uh, of chronic pain so yeah uh, I, I, you, you can give them as an off one of those of each or ketamine infusion if you have terrible severe pain and you're not able to get on the top of it but it has to be in the ICU. Uh, a okay a question from Khaled Salim it's actually in the part that we 
kind of ignored during our lecture today, uh, Mahmoud. It's about the process of uh, laparotomy itself or anesthetic practice of laparotomy. He's asking during rapid sequence induction, is uh, gastric decompression before intubation, especially if the patient is refusing or not cooperative, uh, and are you going to remove the nasogastric tube before intubation? So he's asking about the process itself. I may, I may have a small input after your answer, Mahmoud. Please go ahead. Um, if your patient is coming with an NG tube, by all means, uh, first of all, we haven't ignored that. Like, like, like we agreed, it's more about the, the, the quality of care that we offer those patients rather than a didactic step-by-step analytics. But in answer to this question, yes, aspirate the NG tube. Um, some people take it out uh, before induction, claiming that it will compromise the lower esophageal sphincter. Some will leave it in as long as they aspirated it. Uh, do whatever you feel comfortable with. There is no right or wrong answer uh, about it. Um, most patients, if you explain to them what rapid sequence induction means, they will comply with you. The amount of pressure you put on their neck, uh, on the front of their neck before getting them off to sleep is very, very uh, tolerable. And I always explain to them it's tolerable. It's going to get harder when you're fully asleep, but you won't feel it because you'll be fully asleep. So I'll be really surprised for someone refusing to have uh, cricoid pressure, especially if you sell it to them uh, in um, you know a package of this is for your own benefit in order to not to vomit and aspirate. Uh, but yeah, aspirate the NG tube or even put one in and aspirate and then either take it out or leave it in before inducing your patient. Uh, and my little input uh, here as an ultrasound and echo interested uh, physician, uh, there is a new approach coming uh, like popular uh, since 2014, you can do uh, ultrasound uh, with a curvilinear probe on uh, the gastric antrum and, and like abdominal ultrasound uh, from the subsephoid area. And you can localize if there is any solids or even fluids and you can, cal can calculate the amount. And this will give you like uh, insight of this patient is really fasting or not, or you aspirated the nasogastric tube. There is good number of publications uh, since 2014 until 2020. In these six years, there's good few uh, number of publications. If you can uh, look at them, it's, it's a nice approach. It's easy, it's simple bedside. It costs you nothing and it's easily a uh, learnable one. Uh, a question I by- I would say there's a little caveat to this, Walid, uh, yeah. which is the fact that this approach is for healthy patients presenting for elective surgery. Well, if you have an unwell patient, most probably with potentially full stomach, maybe even in spinal obstruction. Uh, I don't think it's gonna make a change with your decision. I'm not sure whether you agree with that or not. Uh, but it, the, the, the ultrasound, the point of care, uh, ultrasound to check for fasting is a very valid thing, but I think it's more for elective patients, more than emergency ones. Uh, can't agree more on your opinion, uh, particularly this patient usually coming with an acute abdomen, putting the ultrasound probe is very tricky because you need some pressures. Uh, sometimes the stomach is uh, full of air or the colon because of ileus is full of air. So it's not easy to visualize every patient, but it's it's nice approach for this category of patients when you're coming for laparotomy, if it's something you can visualize. So you can judge your patient if he's suitable for this one or not. Uh, okay, so is the rectus sheath infusion, in, in the rectus sheath infusion, why, you didn't use robivacaine dexmedidine mixture, a question by Ahmed Nabil Hamdi. Um, first of all, hi Ahmed. Ahmed is uh, my senior <laughs> back home in Egypt. So uh, first of all, uh, salute from Manchester. Uh, yes, we can use robivacaine, definitely. Uh, here in UK, we don't uh, like mixtures. Uh, so we won't use dexmed uh, etomidine. And if you speak with a lot of, I think you might be working with uh, Rafael Blanco or you have access to talk to him. Uh, here in UK, most of clinicians, uh, regional, regional anesthesia enthusiasts, uh, are not in favor of using mixtures uh, of things. Sometimes they might use adrenaline if they'd like to prolong the block, uh, but not dexmedetomidine, especially it's a very expensive medication. Even an ICU for the licensed use, which is conscious sedation, um, it's, it's used in very small scale because of its uh, price. Uh, Robivacaine definitely is a very good option. You can, you can use it. But what's more handy is levopavivacaine and pluvivacaine. But I have no objection whatsoever to robivacaine. Just the combination with dexmed um, uh, it's, it's not, not something that we do here in the UK. Uh, question before last, and then we'll close the discussion. 
so in a couple of questions. What about uh, quadratus lumborum uh, block for laparotomy, Dr. Uh, you're searching for troubles. <laughs> this is my, <laughs> this is my First of all, you will have to do it bilateral and you will have to poke the patient. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure how you're gonna position your patient in order to do quadratus lumborum block when he's in terrible pain and distended abdomen. Uh, you're searching for troubles because you can cause all sorts of injuries uh, while you're doing this, while the patient is not comfortable and you're not able to position him appropriately. And again, like erector spine, you will have to do it bilaterally. I think, I think one of the very first things that they teach us in medicine is cause no harm. Uh, there are very fancy ideas everywhere, very, a lot of fancy medications everywhere, but it's all about not causing harm. It's being competent in something, comfortable to do it, and causing no harm but what, by what you're doing with your patients. And always think, if you are in their shoes, do you want a clinician that's going rogue and you know trialing things uh, which are not validated in their care or not? I think quadratus lumborum, it's a good block, definitely. I can't, I can't contest this. Most probably you will need to do it bilaterally in order to cover a laparotomy. And there are other means easier and quicker than doing a quadratus lumborum. Me personally, I'm not competent in doing quadratus lumborum, so I won't vouch for it. Okay, uh, so a question by Professor uh, Salah al-Din Mahfouz. Any recommendations regarding COVID-19 and acute uh, laparotomy? Uh, I, I think if you're happy to answer the question, Mahmoud. Oh, of course. Uh, thank you, Brooke Mahfouz. That's really a very, very good question. And I should have covered this in my lecture. Uh, we are in the era of COVID-19 at certain point when all the elective work stopped uh, and trauma went down as well because people were not driving crazy uh, on the motorway anymore. What we were looking after day in, day out uh, are the protomies. Uh, there are no specific recommendations. Uh, the only thing is, A, if your patient is COVID positive, part of your consent, uh, plus the precautions that yourself and your team and the surgical team will take in terms of PPE, et cetera, uh, one of the things that you have to consent the patient on is the fact that he might, there is strong evidence that with GA, they might deteriorate further in terms of their, especially they are undergoing laparotomy and they might be sick because of the laparotomy. They might, they might have massive deterioration uh, because of that up to death. So you have to consent them about this. Uh, the other thing is here in UK now, uh, we are adopting a, a color coded pathways for our patients. So the elective ones are green which means they will be tested for COVID three days before operation and they self-isolate for three days before operation. Used to be two weeks, but they realized that that's not practical and a lot of patients are not able to abide by this. So they reduce this to testing three days before and self-isolation three days before. Then we have the amber or yellow pathway where we're not sure yet about their COVID status. Um, so you can do this and then stratify them. And then we have the red pathway uh, where the patients um, for various reasons, we cannot know their COVID status or they are suspected or positive COVID. And if you cannot know their COVID status, some hospitals have the facility to do fast track COVID tests, uh, which will give huge reassurance to the team. It comes within an hour or so and will give huge reassurance to the rest of the team while they are looking after this patient. Um, restrictions are a bit relax relaxing now with the green pathway patients in terms of PPE but they are still the same with amber and red. And I think it will take very long time until people feel confident to go back to um, the old way of practice, if ever we're gonna go back to the old way of practice. Uh, perfect, so I, I think we have finished the discussion, but there is a question here uh, with uh, Muhammad uh, Ali Ahmad. He's saying, please answer my question. Single shot of rectus sheath block, what do you think? Uh, it's good. We'll, go, we'll give good number of hours of uh, analgesia. You can even do it in the ICU if you're if you're competent in regional anesthesia. It's very easy to perform. Uh, but um, your patient might need a few days of good analgesia. So single shot won't survive forever. It's going to wear off after average of 16, 18 hours. Uh, so single shot is, is good. Now, th there is no problem with that at all. But ideally, you should put a catheter um, if this answers uh, your question. Uh, perfect. So uh, by this question, uh, we are 
now uh, heading towards the end of this week and this session uh, my appreciation i sincere and sincere uh, gratitude for Dr. mahmoud and professor Suleiman uh, for being here tonight uh, giving us time and effort for teaching uh, then in the anesthesia and critical care refresher course and our saving lives academy uh, thanks a million for all of you to be here tonight and hope to see you all next week uh, with a surprise, a very nice surprise uh, will come in a couple of days. It's just cooking. Uh, one of the pioneers in mechanical ventilation will talk next week. Uh, I think he's the most famous uh, professor in Egypt, but I'm just still cooking it. So bear with me for a couple of days more. Uh, see you next week, inshallah, at Saturday, as usual, 9 p.m. Cairo time, with the week number 14 from uh, Anesthesia and Critical Care Refresher course, Saving Lives at the Academy. Thanks so much, have a good night. Thank you, Ali, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thanks everyone.